there's not much quiet in the classroom these days. What is the number one complaint, would you say, of an average parent in the school system today? Whether it's curriculum or discipline or supporting behavioral issues, there is a critical need for reform. By early this year, almost every state in the nation was considering putting parental choice into schools. This week, different states, different approaches, and lots of lessons being learned. Known as the world's oldest profession, prostitution is coming into the open in many cities across America, but not to open arms. What are we allowing to happen in this community? When you come home, you want to feel good. You don't want to deal with, oh, let me walk past the massage parlor where they're soliciting for prostitution. We take a look at both sides of sex in the cities. The COVID pandemic may be out of the headlines, but a legacy of illness is still with us. I was numb up to my back. We take a look at a new documentary that puts a new light on the failed healthcare response. What do you think is the bigger message here? You know, I hope people just will ask more questions and not just accept everything they're told. Welcome to Full Measure, I'm Cheryl Ackeson. School choice is not only a hot button topic, it's quickly becoming a new reality for millions of American school children. In some states, it means letting students take public money to fund their private school education. Or it means letting families choose which public schools their children attend, regardless of where they live. Today, we're off to a lead state in the school choice debate, Missouri, as we take stock of the latest education trends sweeping the country. A teacher and mom, Becky Ucello, is both an observer and a participant in Missouri's school choice movement. I think a lot of parents are looking for just better educational opportunities for their students. Uh, public school system, it's an institutional system, and one size does not fit all. Under Missouri's school choice initiatives, Ucello's special needs daughter, Isabella, age 14, get scholarship money to attend a private religious school. What is the number one complaint, would you say, of an average parent in the school system today? Why they're looking for something else? Whether it's curriculum or discipline or supporting behavioral issues, there is a critical need for reform. As a teacher, I was hoping that COVID would give us a chance to take a step back and reevaluate and once we went back to school, it was business as usual because it takes a lot of energy and effort to make changes in education. And there are a lot of people that don't wanna do the work for it. With COVID-19 restrictions and shutdowns, family frustrations boiled over. By early 2023, at least 42 states, including Missouri, had proposed some form of taxpayer funded school choice. One of the most sweeping school form initiatives was signed earlier this year in Arkansas under Republican Governor Sarah Huckabee Sanders. With new education freedom accounts, parents will be able to send their kids to whatever school works best, whether it's private, public, parochial, or homeschool. Nine states, including Arkansas, have passed universal school choice laws in just the past two years meaning students can qualify to spend some government school money to attend private school, regardless of family income. Missouri mirrors a lot of what we see nationally. Doug Heider heads up Missouri's Association of School Administrators. How would you characterize, among all the states that are considering proposals, what's happening here in Missouri? Several key things which are, are similar to what you see across the country. Uh, this last legislative session, there was an open enrollment bill that was debated, was not passed. Are parents making their voices heard in a stronger way in the past couple of years than you had seen in the previous four or five years? Oh, I, I think definitely so. Uh, Post-COVID, we've seen, and even generally in politics, we've seen a polarization, I believe, uh, on both ends. The one thing to keep in mind is sometimes the loudest voice is not the voice of the majority. 
and making sure that we fully understand what a community wants and why. Missouri has been at the forefront of the school choice debate for 25 years. Yeah, there you go. Earlier this year, under a Republican-dominated state legislature, open enrollment had been considered a sure bet, but the proposal stalled and ultimately failed. Republican Caleb Rowden is Missouri's Senate president. Can you simply define what open enrollment is? Well, basically just as if, if uh, you don't like what you're getting in your district, you, you can go over to a neighboring district. Is it accurate to say open enrollment is really the biggest, latest discussion here? It was the big one this year. Teachers unions want to protect their, their fiefdoms. They want to protect th this, you know, this bu bureaucracy that they've built over the course of time. Um, and, and, and they do that, I think, at the expense of, of giving parents and kids choices. But opposition to open enrollment in Missouri came from more than just teachers unions. I'm really been happy to see coalitions build to stop this school choice train that we've seen across Missouri and across the nation. Democrat Maggie Nuremberg, a Missouri state representative, is a mother of three and a former teacher. What happened in Missouri is that we saw a tremendous pushback, especially from our rural school districts. So if we are, have open enrollment and these small school districts have fewer students in them, they receive fewer resources, they're not going to be able to keep their doors open. In small communities in Missouri, the largest employer is the school district. It is the gathering hub. It's the facility that everybody meets because it's the one spot that can, can uh, accommodate the town. And so rural communities were very um, resistant of the open enrollment choice. Mm -hmm. While rural schools worry about losing students, successful school systems worry about attracting too many under an open enrollment model. Just outside of Kansas City, sought-after schools in Independence, Missouri, finally got enough money to eliminate all school trailers or portables. School Superintendent Dale Hurl. With open enrollment, that could open it up where now we have an influx of kids where our local patrons who are paying their local tax dollars to ensure um, an education for kids that live here, well now those tax dollars are being paid for to educate kids who don't live within our boundaries. You could theoretically be back in a position of having to make mobile classrooms again. Well, I think that would be a very distinct reality that we would have kids that want to move uh, and be educated within independence and we don't have the space, so then we're having to put mobile trailers up again. And, and that honestly does not set very well with, with your local patrons who, who are paying the higher tax burden so that we don't have mobile trailers. State Senator Rowden says there were open enrollment proposals that addressed the concern. You know, there were clauses in there that the, the accepting district has to opt into the program. You know, they have to have room to take the kid. The discussion is about to heat up once again as Missouri prepares to consider bills for its next legislative session. Some Democrats and Republicans are working together to move forward the popular idea of education reform but without some of the perceived wrinkles. I'm partnering with Republicans across the state to come to consensus on different pieces of legislation that we can either co-sponsor or file companion bills. After 25 years, Ucello decided to retire from teaching public students and now teaches at her daughter's private school. I think for me, I was tired of fighting a system that wasn't interested in changing. So families like ours, we don't have time to wait for reform. We want to put our children in the best educational environment now. Numerous school voucher and open enrollment bills are expected in Missouri's upcoming legislative session that begins in January. Ahead on Full Measure, the debate over decriminalizing prostitution. Like many American cities, New York City is suffering an alarming spike in crime. Some blame lax prosecution with many offenses going unpunished. And now the Big Apple is one of numerous cities engaged in a new debate over the crime of prostitution. Will cracking down on the world's oldest profession improve life for the community at large? 
or should authorities ease up and look the other way? Lisa Fletcher reports. This isn't how it should be. This isn't what should be happening in a neighborhood with, uh, you know, with families. Ramses Frias feels like his Queens neighborhood in New York City is unraveling. And his walk home from the elevated seven train confirms it. When you come home, you want to feel good. You don't want to deal with, oh, let me walk past the massage parlor where they're soliciting for prostitution. How certain are you that that's prostitution happening there? A hundred percent certain. It's a regular routine and there's no moral compass on this, you know? It's like, what are we allowing to happen in this community? The state of New York, now among a handful of states considering proposals to do away with making prostitution a crime. On our short walk in Jackson Heights, we passed at least two storefronts identified by locals as brothels, locations where people can pay for sex. They are illegal, but largely ignored by police. I don't get any um, inkling from any of the politicians of this area that things are going to change or that they are even trying to change it. In 1976, New York State banned loitering for the purpose of prostitution. The law widely targeted Times Square, where prostitution was rampant. Clients, those who solicited, called Johns, were largely targeted too. It worked. That get tough approach turned Times Square around. It's now widely considered family friendly and known as the crossroads of the world. Now, a number of cities are looking to change the law by partially or fully decriminalizing prostitution. Fully decriminalizing prostitution takes away the criminal penalties for selling or paying for sex. Proposals for it are being studied in at least 10 states, including New York. Partially decriminalizing it means sex workers won't face charges, but buyers will. Maine was the first state in the nation to pass such a law in June. It's estimated that 90 percent of prostitutes in the state are forced or manipulated, also known as trafficked, into sex work by organized criminals who profit financially from their victims. If you address the small little things, you're not going to have the bigger things, and it doesn't spiral out of control. John Pizzurro spent 25 years with the New Jersey State Police, where he investigated organized crime and human trafficking. Was there a direct line between New York City cracking down on prostitution and the safety and quality of life improving there? Yeah, so like if you go back when things were successful, law enforcement was able to proactively look at quality of life crimes. Today, they don't. Two years ago, the state of New York got rid of that 1976 law that made it a crime to loiter for the purpose of prostitution. Months later, the district attorney in Queens dropped 700 prostitution cases, and Manhattan dropped 5,000. Pizzurro says prostitutes are victims and should not be prosecuted. But, he says, those who are doing the victimizing, be it Johns or traffickers, should not benefit from decriminalization laws. What do you make of this growing movement nationally to decriminalize or even legalize prostitution? A couple things. One, you're going to create more of an environment where traffickers are going to use that to their benefit. Secondly, uh, the victimization is only going to increase. Are the fears that these families are feeling in these communities legitimate? Yeah, and I think that's what people miss is that, you know, some people don't choose where they have the ability to grow up, but aren't they entitled to a safe environment? We are lacking that safe space by bringing in elements that can create um, unrest in their lives. Laura Mullen is a former sex worker in the New York City area. She was held captive by the notoriously violent gang MS-13, raped multiple times and sold into prostitution. Even so, Mullen supports partially decriminalizing prostitution. Like, um, they know you're vulnerable, so they'll bring you in on something that they know that you need. So he had given me drugs and food, and so I owed him for what he had given to me. I kept owing and owing and owing. And so with that, I was paying for with my services. So the longer you stay, the more you owe. Right. And you had nowhere to go. No. Fear of arrest and a criminal record kept Mullen from going to police for help. When I was sexually assaulted, I did not want to go forward to the cops. So if we can take the prostitution charge away, it is going to help the people that are in the street feel like they can 
go to law enforcement if there's an issue. Ramses Frias is concerned his community is losing its grasp on a place that once felt safe for families. About two weeks ago, a lot of interagencies got together and, you know, tried to at least shut down two of them, um, but, uh, but they are open again. And that makes him worried about where it will all end up. There are a lot of people in this community that feel the same way I do, and they're just scared to say it. Who or what are driving the policy changes in states that are having this big discussion now, like Massachusetts and New York? Probably two things. There's a political movement that believes that the laws, like loitering for the purpose of prostitution, are discriminatory against the LGBTQ community. And then there is some evidence-based research, mostly from other countries, that shows when some of these laws are lifted, um, trafficking and prostitution diminishes, and it makes communities and women actually safer. We'll see. Yeah. Interesting debate, thanks. Coming up, the plight of those suffering medical problems after COVID vaccines. The number of people suffering problems after COVID vaccines continues to grow as researchers learn more about how to diagnose and treat the lingering illnesses. A new documentary, The Unseen Crisis, examines the stories of some who got their shots, doctors vilified when they tried to help, and allegations that the government has long been quietly treating a select few of the injured. One doctor's appointment, I just had what seemed like an inflamed wrist, and the next one I was numb up to my back. That's the first time the doctor was like, you have a problem way bigger than your wrist. Like, you need to get your brain checked out. The next day, I went paralyzed on my right leg. So seven days after the vaccine, I had gotten so bad that they placed me on the ventilator for the first time to be able to breathe. So that was kind of the, the first start of it. This is a disease that has to come out of the shadows. Cindy Drew Care is a producer of The Unseen Crisis. How did you first learn there was this population of what you're calling the unseen? Soon after the vaccine rollout, there started to be stories emerging, you know, on Twitter, people posting their own stories or here and there of people who were having a bad reaction to the vaccine. But the other side of it is what, what happened when they tried to share about it, even just posting on Twitter, hey, this is happening or whatever social media to try to find, are there other people who are having the same thing? Uh, what do you know about it? Getting censored, getting called, you know, misinformationists. Was there an organized effort to make sure when people spoke of this, that they got controversialized or censored? It was so consistent um, that to them, like it could only have been, you know, sort of an organized effort. Why would all the social media platforms silence our stories? Why would Facebook, when we have a support group and they're just talking about their own personal stories and trying to get best practices, share advice, learn more about it, you know, tens of thousands of people get shut down by Facebook. Why? You said the FDA and maybe others are well aware of these adverse events that maybe are not officially recognized. How do we know this? So in the film, one of the people I speak with is uh, Brianne Dressen, and she was in the AstraZeneca trials. Her condition was so bad, she was sure she was dying. Nobody in an emergency room, nobody could help her, nobody could diagnose it. Finally, she got lucky. The National Institutes of Health, or NIH, flew her out to join a small-scale study with 22 other vaccine-injured, and it changed everything. They flew us out. We were there in person. We were in the state-of-the-art facilities. They know at a very intimate level what's going on with this. They know about microclotting. They know about the nervous system breakdown. They know about small fiber neuropathy. They know about the cognitive issues. They know all of it. They haven't given that very essential and matter-of-fact treatment to all of the other Americans who stepped up and got their shot. She's like, they studied it and they treated her and they reversed the trajectory of her illness and she got better, a lot better, almost completely better. And this was very early on. And their whole point is, if you just say, hey, maybe this is something that happens, you don't even have to say officially, but heads up, you might see this in your emergency rooms. Here's the test to do, you know, here's how you may treat it then 
people could get help. But because none of that was officially coming down, the doctors in emergency rooms didn't know about it unless they had, you know, put pieces together themselves. People are showing up at the emergency room or the doctor with stroke and other symptoms and not being asked if they've had COVID recently or been vaccinated. It's almost being ignored. It is being ignored. I mean, that's part of the unseenness because doctors also see what happens to people, other doctors that talk about it and make the connections because the doctors in the film and other doctors have been had their licenses threatened or taken away. They've lost jobs. They're, you know, ostracized from the medical community just by talking about it, saying it exists. And what do you think is the bigger message here based on the things that you learned in making the film? One of them is hopefully, as one of the people in the film says, you know, I hope people just will ask more questions and not just accept everything they're told. And I think we should be suspicious anytime we see this instant shutdown of any questioning, of any dissenting voices, of any other medical opinions. I, I, hopefully we've sort of learned that lesson. You can watch the full documentary by going to unseencrisis.com. After a break, what's ahead next week on Full Measure? An update to our reporting on vaccine mandates and a crisis in military recruiting. That way, fix this now! The Army is inviting troops who were kicked out for refusing COVID-19 vaccines to correct the record and maybe even rejoin. Letters recently sent to former service members who were forced out give guidance on how they can request a change in the terms of their separation now that the COVID vaccine requirement has been lifted. Full Measure recently reported that last year, the U.S. military missed its recruiting goals for the first time since the end of the draft and fell short again this year. The vaccine mandates got a lot of publicity in the press. What is the impact of that publicity, do you think? As a member of the military for 30 years, uh, all of us have had to take and continue to take multiple vaccines. So when we applied the vaccine mandate, that was a lawful order. Uh, and while that has been rescinded, we continue to encourage our members to become vaccinated because, again, I need to be able to count on you to go where I need you when I need you to get there. But now the Army letters also advise former troops to contact their local recruiter if they desire to apply to return to service. Coming up next week on Full Measure, a deep dive into a landmark lawsuit that's calling the Biden administration on the carpet for unprecedented government censorship on COVID and more. How important do you see this case in terms of a free speech case? This is the most important First Amendment case in a generation. Missouri versus the Biden administration on the next Full Measure. Thanks for watching, everybody. Until then, we'll be searching for more stories that hold powers accountable. I'm Cheryl Atkinson.